thank you all for coming out on this beautiful sunny Sunday afternoon. Um, I, I would have had a hard time getting out of the collar today. <laughs> but um, basically, I'm going to be talking about my evolution as a basket maker from um, the early 70s through the present day. And um, kind of how I got started and uh, what, how it's evolved over the years. So I probably need to turn the lights off. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think the right. Yeah. Um, so, <coughs> uh, I think over here might be better. Um, my uh, basketry explorations were born out of a back to the land adventure in the early 70s. Uh, when I moved with a group of friends down to a remote river bottom farm in eastern Kentucky. And um, it, was, uh, it was very beautiful, uh, kind of a wild place in the da Daniel Boone National Forest, and had not really been farmed much in the last 20 years or so. So um, this was a big adventure for me. Uh, it was remote in that to access the property, you had to get in a boat, come down the river, and come over to the other side. This picture is taken from the house um, that I lived in, and this farm stretched up around the bend of that river and then up over the mountain into a forested area. So it was quite beautiful, beautiful mountain streams that we would swim in, and, and uh, there's uh, no running water or electricity. Uh, which was very romantic to me at the time, <laughs> with uh, burning kerosene lamps and candles at night, and we milked the cow, and had hogs, and raised chickens, and tobacco, and big gardens. Uh, we moved next door to a property where an old mountain man, Edgel McQueen, would um, come down where he grew up. And he would still come back in the summer times and grow a big garden and fish all summer. So he was really suspicious of us when we first moved in. But because uh, we were just a bunch of kind of wild looking hippies. <laughs> and, uh, but he soon grew to love us and us in turn him. And he really taught us a lot about survival skills um, down on the farm. Most all of us grew up in urban settings or um, I grew up, up out in the country but we you know, my parents didn't farm or garden, and we had electricity and running water and dishwashers. And so um, he taught us gardening um, skills and how to use a team of horses to plow and cultivate their gardens. Uh, this is actually a horse and a mule, Pete and Charlie, but they were our power source. And, uh, and learning how to work with them and uh, um, well, learning how to do everything was, was pretty exciting at the time. <laughs> which one's Pete and which one's Charlie? Pete's the mule, Charlie's the horse, and they were a great team. They really were um, cooperative, unlike a lot of um, mules. Um, mules are typically uh, a little temperamental, and, you know, stubborn, stubborn. as a mule. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they worked really well together. So. Uh, yeah, we got the ball canning book, learned how to can. We had a wood cook stove with canned water stuff in the summertime on this wood cook stove, which was wickedly hot. A uh, lot of, lot of sweating. Yeah. 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 Started it too, George. You're just on time, George. I'm on time. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things Edgel taught us how to do was to grow sorghum cane. And this was an annual event where we would grow the cane, then we would get in our neighbors from surrounding properties, because at this point we had kind of spread out and bought different properties in the area. And so we uh, stripped the cane and cut it, and then Pete's uh, operating the sorghum press here. Uh, ex expressing the juice, which we would then cook into sorghum molasses. So, uh, yeah, Edgel taught us how to do that. 
So in the process of farming, uh, we had clearing parties, and it was during one of these clearing parties in the spring that we had cut down some willow trees. And so this was a really serendipitous um, kind of experience in that it was spring, so the sap was up, and the bark had, was releasing from the trunk of the tree that we had just cut. So my friend, uh, this is some of the Motley crew. That's what the Back to the Landers look like back then. <laughs> uh, the woman, actually, this picture kind of stretched a little bit, but uh, my friend Pam is standing next to me while I'm weaving, I think, my second little bark basket. And uh, she and I were sitting on a felled tree and absentmindedly started peeling this flared bark up. And, you know, before long we had the whole tree stripped. And it was coming off in these really long, flexible pieces, uh, really strong, and we discussed how it must be good for something. So I had done a little textile weaving, so I was inclined to try to weave it. And uh, so, not knowing anything about basketry, not having any basketry books, or taking any basketry classes, this wow. basket on my left was uh, my first little bark basket. Um, you know, pretty crude and primitive. Do you and still have it? I do, yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, and then, um, I don't know, several baskets later, I was improving, as you can see, the basket on the right, but uh, that was my first handled basket. Um, kind of a funky little thing, but it actually uh, served, uh, you know, functionally as my garden basket for a number of years. So it was really trial and error. Every basket I made, I learned from that basket how to make the next basket better, how to improve on it, how to refine things, how to add finishing touches and that kind of thing. And that was really kind of the joyful part of it for me, was just learning on my own and, um, you know, just discovering for myself uh, the, the process, different processes and uh, that I could uh, utilized to make a better basket. So, <laughs> oh, this is so cute. So after five years of living on this farm, I moved back to central Kentucky to another little farm and procured my first and last real job working as an interpreter at Shaker Town at Pleasant Hill. And I was demonstrating uh, Spinning, wool spinning, and weaving on their big looms, old looms there in a sister shop. And um, I did that for about three years. But in the process um, of working there, uh, they discovered that I had some basketry skills, so they had me do an occasional basketry demonstration, um, just one weekend out of every few months or so. And uh, so, once again, kind of serendipity stepped in here with, um, after completing, just completing this hickory bark basket uh, there, a gallery owner from Cincinnati came through and was charmed by this basket and asked if she could commission me to make her one. And um, that was just so <laughs> exciting for me that somebody wanted to actually buy something that I love to do, something that I love to produce. So I took that commission and then, uh, yeah, came to the realization that perhaps other people might be interested in buying my baskets. So I quit my job at Shakertown. Um, well, this was after submitting work to the Kentucky Guild of Artists and Craftsmen. And when I was accepted into that guild, I quit my job at Shakertown and started producing basketry and baskets in earnest. So there I am preparing for my first craft show in 1980. Mm -hmm. So early work. My early work um, was pretty young, uh, pretty basic, no finishing details or anything terribly exciting going on in, in those pieces. Um, just plain plating, kind of wide spokes and weavers. And I experimented with different fibers. This is willow, weeping willow, woven around willow bark spokes. Uh, that all 
also is weeping willow, peeled and unpeeled, the long weeping willow branches woven around willow bark. I uh, worked uh, with a lot of honeysuckle, just green really. I didn't know that if you boiled it, it would actually be more uh, supple. But um, this actually retained the bark too, which I liked. But it was really, let's move that focus. It was really the willow bark that that enchanted me and uh, that I came back to and wanted to make my full fiber focus. Um, it was also a material that attracted collectors because it was unusual. It's not a commonly uh, used material. It's not a traditional basketry material. So I kind of had a little niche by producing uh, the bark baskets, which gave me a, you know, a market. So as I um, continued to explore this, um, this material, I learned that if I split my spokes down in half, I got a finer weave. And that made a more interesting basket for me. And then I realized if I split them down yet again, I got an even finer textured basket. And this is when the uh, bark really revealed its unique uh, character, character. Um, it's um, it when you weave this finely in a plain plating over one under one, you get a more textile-like kind of a drapey, uh, almost fabric-like uh, result. And though this disturbed me in the beginning because I couldn't really control the shape of the basket as well. I quickly realized that this was the beauty of this bark, um, that you could get this really soft, soft, um, almost bag-like result. And it's really not as soft as it looks. I mean, it dries stiff. But as you're weaving, it's very soft, and so it can take on that kind of drapiness and then dry in its form. Um, yeah, so I got real excited about this and really have never gone back to the larger uh, weaving elements. So just, um, I don't know why these are out of focus. Do they seem out of focus? Mm -hmm. okay. No. No? no? no. <coughs> Maybe just from this perspective. But, um, so I started experimenting with some different weaves. This is a twill weave, over two, under two. Began experimenting with different forms, woven handles. Uh, this is a twine woven basket, again, woven handle. And this is just kind of a typical collection on its way to uh, the craft show in, uh, here in Berea, which was my main marketing uh, venue. I really stayed very local for about 20 years, didn't go out of Kentucky at all, just did the Berea Fair about every once or twice a year. So, Can we ask questions um, Well, <laughs> I was hoping to wait till the okay. end because I failed to mention that I'm actually going to try to cut this a little bit short so I can make it to Lila Blando's uh, memorial service, which is at 3. So I'm going to kind of try to dash out in here um, at about a quarter till. So I'll save the questions till the end if that's okay. So the new direction that my work took uh, was in the mid 90s and uh, was inspired by a trip to Seattle where I visited my brother who was living there at the time. And uh, we visited all the museums and galleries and antique shops, shops and came up upon these amazing Native American baskets. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, I had seen pictures of Native baskets, you know, through the years, but just getting right up close to these incredible pieces of um, artwork were just. I was just wowed by them and so inspired and I discovered all these amazing books that were full of beautiful photographs of these pieces and technique diagrams. So I had never really consulted books or made any kind of, you know, studious kind of research um, into basketry until, until these um, I discovered these books and then I just poured over them for the next few months and this 
was the, the first basket I made after coming back from that trip. Mm -hmm. And so I went finer with my twining. I introduced a new, another twining technique, a twill twining, to uh, produce mm -hmm. those subtle geometric mm -hmm. patterns. And then the woven rim, uh, which I fell in love with. And I really think I've only lashed on a couple of rims since then, which was what I always did with my rims. And it's more traditional way of finishing out the piece. And then I discovered cordage. I was so excited about cordage because it's, it made this really wonderfully strong uh, handle. I had had trouble with, over time, handles breaking on my bark baskets. And this, um, this is also something that was done in the Pacific Northwest with cedar bark, which is very similar to the willow bark that I use. So um, once I discovered cordage, I've, I've really put it on almost every single basket ever since. Uh, I, I love the texture and the design element it adds, and then of course just the strength of, of the handle is, is wonderful. So here's a twill piece. Um, I also started adding borders along the top edge. Uh, that was kind of a new design um, element for me. And it um, not only added some, some design interest, but it also strengthened the rim uh, of the basket, or the top edge of the basket. Uh, this is where I uh, tried to combine cordage with a woven handle. And it's an awkward application, I think, uh, of that. But I really like this basket. It was kind of the first one that I did that on. So um, just looking at a couple of baskets here, um, getting a little bit more refined with my handles with the diagonal weave. And then this basket on the right is uh, like three techniques of twining, three different techniques of twining that kind of um, gives the design there. So really the signature for my work is that rather than introducing different materials and different colors, I rely on the bark and then mixing up technique, different technique in that piece to uh, produce the design patterns. So I think there's like five different techniques that I've woven into this piece. And, and it's funny, this piece doesn't have any cordage on it, and it never seemed done to me. No handle, no cordage. I took it to show after show, and um, you know, nobody you know, got attached to it. So I put a handle, a cordage handle on it, and it sold at the next show. So I didn't, you know, other people kind of feel the same way I do about this. So just another piece that, um, mixing up technique there to get my pattern and design um, popping out. But um, so, so basically with my putting more time um, a lot more time into each individual piece, my work became kind of, well, quite a bit more expensive. And I really priced myself out of the local outdoor fair market here um, in Berea that I've been doing for years. So for a few years, I, I put them in galleries. But then when I moved to Madison County in 2000, I was eligible to um, submit my work to the Southern Highlands Craft Guild. So I was able to get a more regional exposure by doing the shows in Asheville. And so that was pretty successful for a few years. And then I started um, submitting my work to the big national craft shows, the Smithsonian Craft Show, the Philadelphia Museum of Art Craft Show, and the American Craft Exposition in Chicago. And I was successfully getting into these shows every year. And so this is really what took my work out into the world, where it got um, you know, so much exposure, and then so many more opportunities really opened up for, for, for me uh, by, by getting out there, uh, which was you know, pretty exciting and kind of stressful, and <laughs> <laughs> but uh, worth, worth it. And so actually, this piece, um, this piece, my very first Smithsonian show, I was so excited I didn't sleep a wink the night before the opening day. 
And so the, the opening day, first hour, first day, I have two people hovering over this basket wanting to buy it at the same time. Wow. So that was like my introduction to the big, you know, <laughs> the big shows. <laughs> and luckily, um, the man that bought this, uh, Stephen Cole, was a big basket collector who specifically collected baskets that were woven by contemporary artists that harvested and processed their own materials. So his, his collection was specific to that. And um, he, a few years later, donated this collection to the Renwick Gallery, which is how my work got into Smithsonian. And, I, and there's two pieces of mine that, that are in that collection. So there was a big opening, you know, big exhibit in the Renwick Gallery, and we went up to the opening, but the government was shut down, so we couldn't get in. <laughs> And uh, that was a little frustrating to stand outside the Renwick knowing this great show was inside, but it was closed down. But, but anyway, um, it was, uh, I saw pictures later of the uh, exhibition. Uh, just another piece that's, uh, my borders, you might notice, are kind of starting to get wider. And uh, this also sold at Smithsonian a few years later. So the bark harvest, uh, that's uh, something I do every year or two, depending on my bark supply. It's done in the, uh, July, which is the hottest, buggiest, snakiest, weediest <laughs> time of year. <laughs> but that is when the outer bark peels more easily from the inner bark. And so this is when I go out. So in the early days, uh, I'd go out with um, a lot of energy and ambition and by myself. I'd go out and uh, go back down to the area that I lived on in the river, on the river, uh, where I had friends still living who generously loaned me their boat. And I'd go out by myself and peel three trees, drag it all into the boat, and then head back to the boat dock where I could hang out with my friends and eat, you know, visit while I peeled bark for the next day and a half. And then, actually, here I'm going back out for more because you can see the bark that's in the boat. So then I go back out and get a couple more trees. So I'd spend four days harvesting by myself, which was really, I mean, I was young and I was, you know, strong, but I was also felt like I'd been run over by a truck after four days of doing that. So finally, after really <coughs> too many years, I smartened up and uh, got my wonderful bark harvesting brother, Tim, <laughs> my loyal companion, who's, who's been harvesting with me now for about 25 years, I think. Um, so so now, now I go out far more serenely and um, go out for one day. I harvest one tree, maybe two, um, and I do a little ritual where I thank the tree for its bark and I ask it to send its living spirit with the bark to inhabit the baskets I make. And um, that's just my way of giving gratitude and honoring and respecting this living uh, entity um, that is really giving its life for my work. And I'm always a little sad about taking the tree, but um, it's also um, just kind of necessary for the work I do. But it's also, this tree is probably 35 years old, 30, 35 years old. And willows are a fast-growing, short-lived tree. They usually begin declining at about this age, and it's kind of rare you see um, an old willow tree, you know, that's older than 50 years. So they, they kind of, they grow fast and then they die. And so I'm kind of getting these trees at their peak and uh, using the bark. So this is the process of scoring around the base of the tree with an ax, then taking a draw knife and starting the peeling <coughs> process. Uh, to separate the bark from the wood, 
and then I'll grab it with my hands and start walking back from the tree and using a whipping motion as it gets further and further up into the tree to release it, to try to release it at the top. And that's usually where it gets hung up in branches or it wants to curl around the smaller diameter of the trunk. Um, so it's, it's pretty vigorous um, work. But that's a great tree. You can see that tree is about a foot in diameter, and it's got no lower branches. I mean, it's a, just a beautiful tree for, for my use. So that, that's the ideal size. I don't really like them much bigger or much smaller. So fast forward 20 years later, and the old girl's still at it. <laughs> <laughs> She's got a little gray, and there's Brother Tim. And we are kind of simultaneously chasing um, our strips up to get the widest, longest strip we can. What, you know, one of us pulls away and then the other and then back and forth until it breaks free from the top. So the next step is to get that outer bark off, which you really have to do right away. So Tim brought a chair that day. That was... <laughs> That's the only day you brought it. The only time you brought a chair. That was a good idea. You should have brought two, though. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have, uh, this is perfect, where it's peeling away just beautifully, the outer bark away from the inner bark in a big, long strip, rather than chip, chip, chipping away, which is sometimes the case. So there's a tree's worth of bark, ready to go into the boat. And I always replant sprouts. Uh, the willow bark has a natural rooting hormone in it, which um, uh, assists it in propagating. And I usually plant 10 to 15 sprouts from the trees that I take. So there we are on our way back to the, the boat dock. Really happy to have gotten all that hard work done. Loading it up the bank and into the truck. And then once home, I go over each individual uh, roll again just to clean up any uh, lingering outer bark and to get it into a manageable size that will fit into my soaking vessel. And then I lay it out in the sun to dry for about a week. Get it good and crispy before I store it so it doesn't mold. So after about a year curing, I cut it into strips, and here I am removing, so I've got the width of the strip cut, and now I'm peeling off the uh, outer layer to get the thickness of the bark I want, and this outer layer I will use, if it's thick enough, I'll use it for weaver, otherwise I'll use it for cordage. So very little gets wasted. And there is a basket in progress. There is just a view into the studio. And I'm working on a really big basket there, which is why I had that chair kind of wedged up um, to, to help hold it steady for me. So recent work, this is work over the last eight, uh, six to eight years, um, and, and more recent. Just going to flash through a few of these. So a lot of cordage there on the left. I just kind of got carried away with it on that one. Twine basket. That, that makes a really firm, firm, strong basket. Here you can kind of see how the basket bottoms put together a little bit. Uh, carried away with cordage again. This basket I've had for, I think, about 10 years. And I bet if I put a handle on it, <laughs> it won't have it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think it will. So this is a piece that Lila Belando bought for me a number of years ago. And it's one of my favorite pieces. And uh, she generously loaned it to an, a traveling exhibition that's been traveling around the country for about three years now. And it uh, rooted, revived, reinvented. And it's a, it's a really great um, overview, historical overview of basketry in America from the Native Americans on up to contemporary work uh, that's being produced. 
and um, I have two pieces in that. Uh, so it was really sweet of her to loan that basket, and I feel really sad she didn't get it back before she before she passed. So that's just a collection of little baskets. I use a lot of my scraps for those two, you know, those little little bitty ones down there. I, I can't stand to throw away scraps. Uh, this was my first large scale basket. So it's, you know, I don't know, 18 inches in diameter, about 18 inches tall, but it's woven finely. I knew that if I wove lar on a large scale with this fine weave, I would get all these great undulations. Um, it was a really challenging basket to make. It was basically a, a, just an ungainly platter for like the first month. It seemed like it would never get off the ground. And then finally, after about six weeks, I still wasn't sure I'd have anything I could take in public. And, and this was right before a big show, and I was spending all this time on it. So it was a little bit stressful. And then my spokes were too short because the bottom kept going out, so I had to sneak in new spokes under that uh, rim band there. But it turned out really well. I was really happy with it. Um, I got it done in time for the show, and um, I sold that basket. So that was the other thing. I was, I was kind of shy of putting so much time into a large piece you know, because then it would be really expensive. And I just wasn't sure buyers were, you know, would support that kind of uh, effort. So I made another big one after that first one sold. And it, once again, extremely challenging, a lot more twining in it. I think I got this one done two days before the show because I brought it to Bob to photograph, like, the day before I left for the show. Anyway, um, I, I told myself I was never going to make another big basket until this one sold. And this one actually found a home this past week. So uh, I guess I might make another big mm -hmm. basket. Mm -hmm. And this is the one that's here right below it. Um, so once again, I'm, I'm loving weaving these fine uh, baskets in this plain weave, which brings out all of this wonky kind of um, undulation that I I find charming. I I just think they're they're cool. So one other direction I've been going in is, are the randomly woven pieces, and these to me have been really fun. They just seem more. Uh, invocative of nature, like a little bird's nest, or something you'd find uh, growing in, out along a woodland path or something. It's just, I, I just have fun with these. They just feel more organic, and they're more flowing, less structured. So this is willow bark and honeysuckle. These also, a uh, willow bark infrastructure, a hexagonal woven inner basket and I'm weaving this uh, willow dyed uh, honeysuckle through. And actually I was recently commissioned by a big leather company out of Spain, an old leather company, that had commissioned 10 basket makers from around the world to reproduce their designs with, with the company's leather. And this is for a big international exhibit exhibition in uh, Milan, Italy next month. So this was a big, you know, this is my first international exhibition. <laughs> so this has been kind of exciting for me. And it turned out really well. I don't have a picture of it, but it, it was it was a good project, fun project. It was actually really fun just pulling that all that material off a spool. <laughs> Instead of having to harvest it and boil it and get the bark off and dye it. It's just it was, it was really easy. And then that's a completely uh, willow bark woven random weave. Did you get any pictures of the leather? I did, just, but not professional pictures. I do have some you know, that I took at home. So just finishing up, this, this also is just another little simple basket that I wove out of willow bark. And I had it for years. Took it to shows. Nobody was interested in it. And then I put this wild, wonky 
a honeysuckle handle on it that had this bark and all these little bark tendrils hanging off of it. And the next show, it sold opening night. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's just people really seem to like the, the wild, wonky stuff. And I, and I do too, so. It never seemed finished anyway before I put that on there. So, uh, circa 1973, uh, the basket on the right, 2013, so there's 40 years of weaving uh, between those two pieces. So, just goes to show if you <laughs> kind of stick, stick with something long enough, you might, you might get, you know, okay with it. <laughs> well, that is okay. Um, yeah, I've been um, numbering them. I actually started weaving in 73, but I didn't start numbering them until about 80. So, and really, I was just playing around. I wasn't seriously pursuing basketry in the 70s, just kind of learning and playing with it. But um, once I started producing, I, I began numbering, and I'm up to, I want to say, 810 which is not that many baskets in all those years, really, when you think about it. But um, some of them being pieces that take a couple of months, or typically a basket would take, I mean, I think, I actually think I have five weeks in this piece. Um, and probably two and a half, um, um, around two months. So many hours a day? Uh, about five. If I'm getting ready for a show, five to six hours a day. Uh, otherwise, typically about four feels good. If I overdo it, my hands are getting tired. You know, that's why that randomly woven stuff is easier on my hands. Um, but, you know, after all the years of doing this, I've developed a couple little spots that kind of talk to me a little bit. So I'm trying to back off and not do too much in one day. But, um, do you twine right to left or right to right? <laughs> well, what do you mean? I mean, I, I'm always weaving right to right to uh, left, left to right, right. Okay. but sometimes I'll do an S twine or a Z twine, depending on which way I'm twisting that bar. Yeah. yeah. But since I'm right-handed, typically right-handed people weave um, left to right. Why don't you tell them about weaving inside the basket to begin with? Yeah, because since I taught myself, I taught myself a lot of really bad habits. And so for a long time, um, yeah, I was weaving. If I just looked at pictures of the people weaving, you know, everybody's always weaving on the outside of their basket, kind of turning the basket and weaving. They keep their arms close, you know, which cuts down on stress in your shoulders. But I was weaving out here on the outside of the basket, not even seeing the outside, just seeing the inside. And I made a lot, a lot of baskets like that. Um, and, uh, but I would feel myself getting kind of fatigued, um, especially on larger pieces. And, and it was when I was actually beginning to be to, um, asked to teach that I realized I had to not teach those bad habits. So then I started weaving on the outside, which really works so much better. <laughs> Could you share a little bit with us, Jennifer, about the teaching aspect? What do you mean when you started to teach? Uh, well, I, well, I've been teaching, actually, I mean, off and on throughout all this whole time. More informally in the early uh, years, there's a group of um, also kind of back to the landers who we were friends with during our back to the land in this you know, adventure in the 70s, who lived in Monterey, Kentucky. And so they had this little school, Cedar, Cedar something school. Um, but anyway, they hired me to come down and uh, we'd go out and harvest bark. Uh, there was a river bottom farm we had access to with a lot of willows. And we would harvest bark one day, then take it back and then start, um, you know, peel it and start cutting this green bark and everybody would make these big baskets and a lot of people would get done by the end of the three day weekend but a lot, a lot of people wouldn't but um, it was really informal and I, I think then I was teaching people my bad habits <laughs> but um, but then I started teaching like you know at the National Basketry Organization conferences you know at Aramont and different conferences around the country and I've been invited 
to different um, craft schools, you know, to teach. So um, in teaching, um, since there's a limited period of time, I basically uh, create these kits. You know, I, I process the bark and have this bark ready for students because there's not enough time for them to cut and clean and then leave a basket and get done in a, in a three-day workshop, which is, they're generally three days. So, um, um, I mean, that's all, that's all been really good. Actually, I've enjoyed it. I've gotten to travel to different parts of the country, meet a lot of great weavers. I always learn from, from, um, from my students, who are all mostly pretty, you know, adept weavers themselves. So you always learn little tricks and get new ideas. And uh, I enjoy the teaching, but it takes a lot. Like if I'm processing fiber for students, and that takes a lot of the time that I otherwise would be making my own work. I, I'm finding, um, like last year, I taught two workshops, and the one two the year before that. I'm just teaching one this year. But um, just the time in preparing bark and then teaching, I'm just I'm le much less focused with my studio work. So that's a, a little bit of a problem. Are your students a, a mix of men and women, or has it been predominantly women over uh, the years? Or? It's predominantly women, but there's an occasional guy. Yeah, yeah. once in a while? Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, the workshops had a lot of men. They did, they did back in the early days. And like, pulling that bark off the tree. <laughs> I have an economics question. You showed the one uh, slide earlier, a number of baskets on uh, on a porch, and you said that you were selling those baskets at the uh, Arts and Crafts Fair here. Mm -hmm. What would be the value of those? I, I mean, monetary value. What would those sell for um, at those time? And I and then give us a can you give us an idea of, of your contemporary work of uh, the money uh, value of your at that time? I think I was selling baskets like I think some small ones like. I remember I was selling my miniatures for like $25, which was really, you know, not enough. I never sold them for enough. I didn't have a concept of retail and um, wholesale, kind of like I would count my hours. I'd figure, well, I need to make this much, you know, per hour, which wasn't very much. I didn't, I wasn't real ambitious at first about um, how much I was making. But then I would mark it up for retail to cover my expenses while I'm at the fair and the booth fee and stuff like that. So I had a lot to learn about that, all that. But my baskets I would sell for 50, 75, 100, 150, 200, depending on the intricacy of the weave. Um, now, you know, like the, the piece that went into Smithsonian was 3,600. That really big, uh, that first big basket went for. Well, I had 9,000 on it, but I, you know, I gave them a 10% discount, so I got 8,100. So, I mean, you know, they're they're typically selling for, you know, around the 3,000. I'd say a typical uh, basket, $3,000 range. Do you have time to mention about the encaustic uh, technique oh, that you've so, added? So now, yeah, with these large pieces, I've been applying encaustic um, because, like, that first big one. Um, it had a tendency to want to kind of, you know, just start listing a little bit. And then before a show, I'd soak it and kind of prop it back up. And then, you know, <laughs> because of that fine weave and the size of it. And um, so I decided I had to do something um, because they want to, you know, sell this expensive basket and then have it fall over on them. So uh, I had a friend that was doing encaustic work, and she was really... You know, What's that? crazy no, about no, no, no. encaustic is um, beeswax and Damar resin, tree resin. It's a natural, it's all natural, but uh, you melt it down and then you paint it on the basket and then you take a heat gun and kind of melt it into the, kind of drive it into the fiber and melt it in there and then dab off any extra. And so what it does is it, it really did harden the basket. It hardened it. Um, mm -hmm. but, but it also really firmed up the form, like this basket. I had one that was real tall like this and was just would not stand up. I mean, I'd get it back up and then go back over. So um, now it stays put. But it, um, it, what I do like about it, it kind of took it to another level, almost to like a more sculptural 
level, like almost like a woolen pot, by hardening it a little bit. And it enriched the bark, you know, it just made it kind of glow a little bit, made it darker, made it more moist looking. Um, this one has no encaustic on it. It's just mm -hmm. got a little bit drier uh, look to it. I think this also really serves to protect it. Mm -hmm. um, these pieces I also put encaustic on because they were so light, you know, they were a little, little easier to tip over being tall, but now they're a little bit heavier. So I, I like encaustic for the big work. Awesome. So does anybody else have any questions? Time for you to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>